Uh, enough screwing around with that mic. Hi, this is Jim the Keys bartender coming to you live Monday. I normally don't do a Monday podcast because I go right into work around 10.30, but I am psyching myself out. This is, yeah, right before I work. It's my double day. About 13 hours, maybe. Maybe a little less. Maybe 12, 12 and a half. For an older guy, it is, you know. It just kind of drags on for me. But I l- luckily, I have my uh, the clientele to help me going. And you listeners making me think about what this is all meant for. Why, why are we here? Why do I do this thing? Why do I show up for work? I'm not talking about just podcasting. I'm talking about life itself, right? You have to get up, go to work. Mondays are hard for a lot of people. Not necessarily for me. Now, on Friday, I always get everyone coming in cheerfully going, Happy Friday! You know, that's the beginning of my week. Now, that's where I make my money. And my money helps me live. Provides the comforts that my family and I enjoy. But, uh, yeah, just taking an ordinate you know, celebration that... A particular day is here. And in a different part of your life. Meaning like, oh, I hate my job so much, I'm so happy that it's Friday. Maybe, uh, yeah, that's great to have that looking forward. Everyone is, everybody's working for the weekend. <laughs> that's What's that from? Lover boy. Yeah. I mean, what's that say about your week? Why can't the week be fun? So, when I hear that stuff like that, I may feel, hey, yeah, I'm going to go and be an asshole the whole weekend because I hate my life during the week. I I think in my head, well, I got to work the weekend, watch them, you know, celebrate. I said, I should celebrate with them. Because they say, hey, I'm having a great time, but you know what? This is my week. And... When they, people come in for lunch, they go, happy Monday, you know, because Monday's my Friday. And around 4 o'clock, that's halfway to my weekend. But, you know, I don't do the shit that I used to do, but I actually I have my other jobs to take care of, too. So I really, that just means when I have more free time, I have more free time to do other things. And what, I mean, if we label something work and label something pastime, an avocation, a hobby, does it make it that much easier? Does it really matter that you're working? Can you enjoy your work? I mean, there's a lot of people that do enjoy their work, but I think we're so ingrained in it. It's ingrained as work, work, work for retirement. Because you talk about retirement, you hear retirement, 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 retirement. Well... If you want to look at what retirement really looks like, you have to go to like places like the Villages or Naples or Sarasota. There's places in Arizona. Those big retirement communities. As people do enjoy it. And there's a lot of people that miss their work. There's, there's people, you always see this doctor working into his 90s or this... Uh, Christ, it could be anybody, accountant, a pope. Popes like to work late in their lives. Until they you know, until recently they didn't retire. It was only that Benedict. Benedict uh, retired the one before John Paul, I think he died, right? I here I am a Roman Catholic, I should know that. But uh and I should say nice things about John Paul because it's kind of practically the patron patron saint of Poland. Uh and I live with a Polish and half Polish woman. I, I call my daughter a half Polish woman, so I got to be careful. But she's not all serious about religious figures as you know other other people are. And I apologize; I don't want to hurt my listenership in Poland because John Paul was great. John Paul the second, you know, John Paul the first. Well, he lived like two months. Some I remember that in the 80s. He was just like a pope and then another pope. 
and there was a pope before him. And it's like the pope before, the couple popes before John Paul II. They were kind of like the same pope you see like in World War I, the 20s, the 30s, the 40s. I mean, I think John, the, the guy that did Vatican II probably was pretty exciting. You know, because I think he, I think he had a wife and a kid. I mean, a secret wife and kid. Who knows? I I shouldn't say that. I mean, one of those crazy conspiracy shows. But I'm talking about working and retirement. Like, if work is that grinding, soul-crushing, empty feeling that you have to get through during the day. You get through in a day. It's a challenge. There's going to be challenges today over... You know, because someone comes in, they need to, I came in, I wanted to get the barbecue. I mean, we don't have barbecue anymore. We haven't had barbecue in a, almost a year and a half. Oh. I said, well, I was here last week. No, wait, wait. You just told me you haven't been in Florida since before the pandemic. So you weren't here last week. You just got here, right? Yes. So what you mean, instead of last week, you mean a year and a half ago. Oh yeah, okay. Ah, uh, you know, I I I realize a lot of times it's hard to take advice from me on positive motivational stuff when I'm such, you know, I default to to being a um, wise ass. Right? I'm sarcastic. So that's my default. So it's hard to make that switch over. Yeah. I mean, I guess I, I have been that thing where I'm sarcastic down. I try to be sarcastic up. And I hope you never know what's going in someone, especially going on in someone. You can know what's going in someone, right? I mean, but you never know what's going on with some people. But when I'm sarcastic and light, I'm trying to be light and fun. And hopefully they can take it and laugh at themselves. But some people, I guess, maybe they're too busy laughing at themselves and not, you know, not doing any other thing. But I digress. We're talking about work. Again, I'm going to focus. Work. Right? Well, it's the thing we do. Their money. We provide some service, some activity in order to get compensated in a monetary compensation, right? For some, I guess it's called consideration, right? Consideration is payment. And we have to provide a value, and that value is is work. Now, if you're really skilled at something, it's your skill, and you love it. Why would you consider it work? You can get paid for it. You can get paid well for it. It doesn't have to be drudgery. You know, if you're an expert plumber and you look at a problem and say, well, I know what the problem is here and I know what needs to be done. I know how we can fix it. Can't you revel in your competency, your abilities? And sometimes when you look at something, you can say, oh, well, I got to figure this out. I mean, it may be not be a, it won't be a Sherlock Holmes mystery, but it could certainly be fulfilling. And the type of job, as long I guess, I mean, imagine if you just such a repetitive job. If you had a repetitive job, you worked on an assembly line, and your job was, let's say, you worked in the cell phone company, <clears throat> and your job was to put the plastic cover over the phone or the metal cover, whatever. And that was your part of the assembly line. To do that, check it, and, you know, hit the power button. And that's what you do on thousands of phones a day. I can see. That would be grudge. I worked in a factory at one point. When I was in my second year of college, I worked at a circuit board company. And what I worked in, I worked in different departments. I was in something called reflow, where after they plate 
the circuit boards. They played it with metals. They heat it up, kind of melt down the circuits a little to flatten them out. And I worked in imaging. And that's where you put on a dry film on the, on these boards. And a picture of the circuits. And you'd expose part of it. And uh, film would harden over the areas that you don't want to plate. We create a film, right? And the, the the light unexposed areas would be the circuits, and you wash those off, and that's where when you dip the circuit boards in. But I mean, it was even though there were different sizes, and there was very rarely much different. It was just maybe a different shape of a board that we put dry film on. So we do thousands and thousands and thousands. And it could, oh, my God, repetitive work. I hate to say this, but you're going to have to have some kind of, you're going to have to have some secret inter- internal world where you have to imagine something to be able to do the same thing over and over again. You have to think new thoughts every day. You know? Maybe you'd have to go, I mean, old days, you could just flip over and you go through the whole, whole encyclopedia and, and let's say contemplate, depending on the size of the subject or article, it for a week or a day, a new idea. And that's different. I know it sounds kind of confusing, but then you got to be able to work. You got to be able to summon up some type of enthusiasm. You ever seen the movie Joe versus a Volcano? It's Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan. Pre-operative. Pre, pre-operative Meg Ryan. If we get later, maybe we'll talk about Michelle Pfeiffer, Meg Ryan, and Melanie Griffith, about all these women who've had facial reconstructive surgery. Great beauties of our time. Uh, that's sad. Well, that's work too, isn't it? Right? I guess that that's work. And that's pretty you know, the being a female, a beautiful young beautiful female actress known for that. Boy, that's got to be an ephemeral place to be. When you say ephemeral, like a cut flower that wilts so quick. Not everyone could be like a Helen Mirren who has lead roles until she's 70, what? seventy In her late 70s. Love interest. You know, playing from a queen to a, uh, you know, a vixen in her 70s. But you get other ones, they just, you know, that's there's, there's the work. They, got it. they may have like five, six years. Did you see how they disappear, these starlets? So, I mean, they have something to look at. Some of these guys, too, depending on the, you know, pretty boys, how long they last. But that's work. That's kind of dark, some dark shit. You're raised up real high, aren't you? Just like an athlete. And if you're an athlete like Michael Jordan, hopefully that your Hall of Fame status keeps you in the forefront even 30 years after you stop playing. Right? 30 something years after you stop playing. Or 20, 20, uh, however long. But 20 something years after you stop playing, you're still considered, if not the greatest, one of the greatest. And you're the topic of conversation. A lot of people, once they're out of their job, whether they're a, a professional star or someone moving, out of the office retiring. They're replaced all too quickly. Unless they're one of those superstars and they have tons of stories about them. Right? We always tell those stories about the people we used to work with. And there's one particular crazy one you hear about and they have lots of stories so they'd be happy to tell them. You know? So, motivating yourself to go in there and then provide a good job without kind of... You know, sometimes, no matter what job you have, think about it. 
Think about all the jobs, all the jobs you're going to have, how great you think you, you have it or someone else has it. It's rarely, it's rarely the person in it that thinks it's great. You know, maybe superstar athlete that gets a big contract or CEO of a company that just went public. You know, and they're worth billions of dollars. Could be a, one of those tech innovators. But even then, you know, people have down days. I'm mean, just consider what was it? Uh, a week and a half ago, Elon Musk hosted Saturday Night Live. And his, I don't know, there was correlation, was there a correlation or not, but his main cryptocurrency that he's been endurance dropped over 30% following his appearance. Right? What do you do? Um, I'm going to be signing off. I'm probably going to do a short episode because I think the wife's going to be here. Let me double check. Right here. No, she is not. Okay. Well, it's one of the things I like to do for work. So I was talking about no matter how much you're compensated, how great you you know, think your job is, there's someone that's, once you reach that pinnacle, and there's people that are stuck I mean, obviously, there's people that are stuck in those repetitive jobs and how depressing that is. If you can be depressed being a billionaire, you can be depressed being pauper. But conversely, if you can be happy, you can be happy in any condition. So you could be unhappy in any position or you can be happy in any position. As long as, obviously doesn't involve torture and imprisonment and things like that. You always think of those poor people in those Chinese workhouses or the stereotypical Chinese workhouses. Foxcom, was it Foxcom over there in China where they had to put big nets outside these factories because some people who were working in, I mean, in some kind of indentured servitude or they were locked in the contract, they really couldn't leave. Or they ruined their professional prospects. And that would be it for them. So your, your future was tied to your performance. In the United States, it's not. Oh, well, it is tied to your performance. But you could actually, the people in the United States, they go and impersonate someone I mean, down here in the Keys, you see, I've seen, I have seen managers that had no formal training or really experience whatsoever other than w- almost like one of those impersonator syndromes. Like, catch me if you can, Leonardo DiCaprio and catch me if you can. I mean, I can be a restaurant manager. I know how to eat. I know how to walk food to people. Really, that's what they think it is. They, you know, some people think it, that's why everyone has this bar owner fantasy. A bar, a bar. I wish I owned a bar. You know, especially drinkers. Wouldn't it be great? I mean, I knew guys in Philadelphia that were in a. God, they were in the one of the departments. I don't want to say what it was, but it was a group of guys in that department. And they bought a bar in a neighborhood. It's a kind of a tiny micro Polish section, Port Richmond uh, in Philadelphia. And they bought this a, a bar that was, I guess it was a couple of years after it, the owner passed away and they never renewed their license or whatever. They had a license and they just bought it. Maybe it was up for taxes or something like that and they bought it at auction. And they would go there and hang out with each other. Which they go, you know, that's, you could just go to someone's basement. All you have to do is, if you wanted to, you could have just renovated someone's basement. Just go and visit them in there. At least someone would be there. It wouldn't be depressing. Uh, but this is what they did. But the, you rarely do you see these people that, you know, have this 
fantasy of owning a bar. You know, have their friends. I'd be a bar owner. I can. No one could cut me off. Uh, I mean, I haven't had to cut off an owner yet, but I won't say that. I ha- I, you know, I I won't. But the fantasy of owning. There's there's only hard work involved with that. There's responsibility, hard work, and liability. Responsibility and liability. A lot of liability in owning a bar. Or a restaurant. You know, there's a lot of safety issues and health issues you have to maintain and you hope everyone's on the board with the same priorities that you have. You know, that you want to be clean and you want to make sure that you run a profit and that there's no illegal activity happening inside your establishment because something happens in certain places when you allow illegal activity to thrive it just blossoms you know it just becomes a place for it and you just got to watch out for it And so I tell people, I'm saying, listen, uh, if you want, you're welcome, the welcome to try. But uh, if I got a whiff of it, you know, I'm going to kibosh it. You know, that's what I would do. So my point is with uh, work is that, you know, you can fantasize about it, like the bar owners and stuff. They're not realizing that what it's like to own a bar. You know, that everyone wants, you know, you'd have, you could give everything away. That's the reason why you see that show Bar Rescue. There's so many people that go into bars with very spotty understanding of what it takes to run a bar or restaurant. And it's one of the things you see all the time. It's like virtually no one decides to become a locksmith without knowing how to fix locks or make keys. Right? If you don't know how to work with those things, why would it, why would you become a metal smith unless you knew how to be in the metallurgical arts? You know, hardware store, auto parts store. There's usually a basic understanding of that. The basic understanding when it comes to uh, restaurants and bars is, oh, I know how to eat and I know how to drink. I know how so- to tell someone what to do. That's not not even close. But that that fantasy is also a fantasy of finding a job that you think you're going to love. And, you know, quickly, if you did something like that, and let's say you learned how to run a bar or a restaurant, you think you would learn to love it when it's all your responsibility. And then when you go home at night, you're thinking about it. You're like, hey, I just bought all that chicken. I better freeze it or whatever because I don't know if I'm going to use all that chicken. I don't want all my product uh, wasting away or rotting. How much should I buy? Should I run out of this? Should I run out of that? How much stock should I keep on hand? You know, just one of those things. It's just anything you get involved in that's a uh, a vocation and you turn it into a vocation, it's going to just fill up your, your waking thoughts with ideas of how can I do this better? How can I make it better? And things like that. So, to get back to the original idea of the show was just go and enjoy work, enjoying the experiences that you have, especially for the people that everything's new. Every phone call's new. Every interaction you have with someone is new. I do notary work. And I realize the same thing I do on a notary, I do the same thing for notarizing documents. So certain documents require certain notarization. That's it. But the person that you're going to meet and you're going to notarize their signature, they're always different. And situations are always different. You could be notarizing the same thing, but situations are always different. Every moment is different. And that's what's significant if you live in the moment. If you live in the moment, you can live in the moment when you're, uh, when it's like, Oh my gosh, you know, happy Friday to you. You can live in a moment then or you can say, hey, you had a case of the Mondays. Just live in a moment. Enjoy the moment when you're going in. 
enjoying a, a cup of coffee, enjoying an email from someone, a humorous email of a monkey masturbating or something like that. Who knows? You never know what's going to happen, what's going to make you laugh, and what's going to bring you joy today. And it may be at work. Don't automatically think that at work it's going to make you unhappy. And it's, you know, it's practically, it's a couple minutes right now. It's a couple minutes of 10 a.m. You got two hours till lunch. Depend on what your work day is like, you know. If your work day doesn't, you know, if it's not 12, it could be 1. Who knows? You, you could be going to the Olive Garden. But watch out for the endless basket of breadsticks, though. You don't want to eat all the carbs. That'll just make you sleepy. You'll get sleepy around 2, 3 o'clock. I always had that thing. I got to watch what I eat. I got to watch the amount of carbs that I have. I get sleepy right around 2 or 3 o'clock. Listen, folks, if you are in Key Largo, come to Mile Marker 102 to the Catch Restaurant and Bar. It's open every day of the week for lunch and dinner. Monday through Fridays, they have happy hour 3.30, 6.30. And we also have fine um, happy hour drinks and some food specials. And there's plenty of seafood dishes at the catch as well as non-seafood dishes. So if you come to the catch, ask for... Uh, well, don't ask for you. Just t- just tell them that the Keys bartender sent you, and uh, say hello to the gang there. My name is Jim. I'd like to thank you for listening. If you like the show, please share it with your friends. Uh, like us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, send me an email if you have any questions to Jim at keysbartender dot com. Let's get this music off. Uh, hopefully, the uh, sound came out all right. Thank you. <laughs>